Um, glad to be in Seattle. Uh, I'm, uh, I really appreciate uh, that uh, I was invited to speak here tonight <clears throat> about the internet. So, uh, the internet. I mean, I think we all know what the internet is. We all talk about it all the time and we all use it all the time, clearly. Um, but increasingly, we're also freaked out by it and we're scared by it, especially after uh, President Donald Trump won the election. Um, I was in D.C. Uh, just a few days ago and speaking to people there, I, um, um, well, you get the sense that everybody, or just about everybody in D.C. is convinced that uh, Vladimir Putin um, took what was normally a, a glorious um, democratic technology, uh, the Internet, right, and turned it into a weapon of influence, uh, a weapon of influence that then he uh, trained on the American people and then used it to help elect Donald Trump. And if you uh, have uh, if you turn on MSNBC at any given day, you'll probably find an analyst or two talking about how what happened uh, during the election with the internet was unprecedented. Never before uh, in the history of this technology uh, has the internet been used to influence people, and especially by a government, right? That's the sense that you get. And um, this, there's a widespread panic about this, about the weaponization of the internet. And to counter this weaponization, um, our senators in Capitol Hill have been um, pressuring Silicon Valley companies like Google, Facebook, and Twitter to work even more closely with intelligence agencies in order to secure the internet and, and to protect it from uh, malign foreign influence. Um, now, if you know anything about the history of the internet, this naive outrage would be funny and comic. Um, but the problem is, is that it comes with possible danger, right? This outrage, because what it's pushing people to do is to um, to hand over even more power to spies in Silicon Valley companies and uh, and hand them more control over the internet, even more control that they already have. But there's another uh, aspect to the story. Um, the outrage about Russia's weaponization of the internet is based on a deeply flawed premise. It's this idea that there was ever a point in the internet's history when it wasn't used as a weapon. Um, the notion, the popular notion, um, that the internet is some kind of magic democracy machine is a myth. Um, the internet was designed by the Pentagon to be a weapon of influence, a weapon of surveillance, and a weapon of social control from the very beginning, going back to the 1960s when it was, being de when it was developed by ARPA, the R&D wing of the Pentagon that we know, uh, now know as ARPA. Um, <clears throat> it was an information weapon then, and it remains an information weapon today in its privatized and commercial form, um, much more powerful than today than anyone in the 1960s or 1970s could have imagined. Um, yet, yet for years we've been fed a myth about the origins of the internet. We've learned and been told about its supposed utopian, uh, its democratic and egalitarian potential. Um, it's a technology that's supposed to lead to a better world, to equalize power uh, between uh, average citizens and average people and the most powerful corporations, the most powerful entities in the world. Um, it was supposed to lead to global direct democracy. Um, it was supposed to erase corruption and, and erase the need for uh, governments altogether because we would be able to come together as a, as a people on a global level and decide our own fates individually, but collectively as well, mediated by this technology. Um, it's been a very clever and extremely successful marketing campaign because you can't really call it anything else but that. Um, and this campaign has rebranded uh, what has always been a military technology, uh, a technology built by military contractors into something democratic and egalitarian. And it's kind of amazing once you go back and look at it, the fact that this was able to, that they pulled it off, that, um, that we have actually been convinced that this is true. And I remember um, the beginnings of this um, because I was born in the Soviet Union and my family and I, we um, eventually ended up 
in San Francisco, right at the start of the dot-com boom. Um, and we had fled a, um, a failed utopia. Um, in my homeland, um, communism had failed, right? And um, the ideals, the ideas of, of, of communism, they were no more, that was dead. And it was turning into this very dark, oligarchic place. Um, and so uh, we fled that. And, but when we came to San Francisco, uh, we found out that a new utopia was at hand, right? That um, communism was dead, but the internet was about to take its place. Um, and that the internet and uh, Silicon Valley and uh, a market economy would uh, bring into being all the things that communism could not achieve. Uh, it would end hunger, poverty, it would equalize um, power relations, it would end inequality, it would destroy corruption because in this kind of system, fully transparent, fully, um, um, fully system of direct democracy, there could be no corruption because who would be corrupt? We'd all be working together in this, on this platform. Um, of course, the utopian promise of the internet uh, didn't come true, right? Today, America is less equal than it was 30 years ago, right? Um, there's more poverty, there's more unemployment. Uh, even the average lifespan of Americans is, has been dropping. Um, and the internet itself is also not very egalitarian or democratic. It's a, it's a private telecommunication system that's dominated by immensely powerful corporations um, that have um, turned this platform into a for-profit surveillance machine and are extracting incredible amounts of money out of it. Um, so the question is, what happened, right? Um, how did this utopian technology or supposedly utopian technology go astray? Uh, how do we make sense of it? Well, to understand what the internet is and what the internet has become, you have to go back to the very beginning, uh, back to the 1960s when the internet was being created by the Pentagon. Uh, back then, America was a relatively new global empire um, facing an increasingly chaotic and violent world. Uh, there was the Vietnam War that was central, but the U.S. was facing um, insurgencies all around the world, uh, from Latin America to, South to Southeast Asia. It was also facing an increasingly uh, volatile and uh, violent uh, domestic environment. You had the uh, anti-war uh, movement, you had um, militant black activism, you had groups like the Weather, the weather Underground uh, that, that were blow, uh, setting out bombs uh, seemingly daily all, in cities all across the country. Um, you had race riots in major cities. Um, and America's paranoid generals looked at this, right, and they saw a vast communist conspiracy, of course. Uh, they saw the Soviet Union expanding globally underwriting insurgencies all around the world, backing uh, countries that were opposed to America. At the same time, they were underwriting um, opposition movements in America. Uh, and they saw this as a new kind of war that was happening. Uh, this, is not, this is not a war, this is not a traditional war that you could uh, fight with traditional weapons. This is not a war that you could uh, drop a nuke on. It was not a war that you could send a tank division into because the combatants um, did not wear uniforms and they did not march in formation. They were part of the civilian population of the conflicts that they were taking part in. So, so it was a new kind of war, a new kind of, an, an insurgency, a global insurgency. And in certain um, rarefied circles in the military, uh, people who were uh, um, familiar with the new, new kind of computer technology being developed, uh, they believed that the only way to fight and win this new war was to develop um, new information weapons. Um, computer technology that could uh, ingest data on uh, people and political movements, that could um, um, combine opinion surveys, economic data, criminal histories, um, um, draft histories, photographs, uh, telephone conversations intercepted by the security uh, services. And put that all into uh, a d databases that could allow uh, analysts to um, perform sophisticated um, an analysis on it, 
and, to, and run predictive surveys. The idea was you have to find out who the enemy is and isolate it from the general population and then take that enemy out. And at the time, some even dreamed of one day creating a uh, global system of management that could uh, watch the world in real time and intercept threats before they happened, in much the same way that America's early warning radar defense system did for hostile aircraft. This is the general background from, from which the internet emerged. Today, it's counterinsurgency origins. The counterinsurgency origins of the internet have been obscured. Uh, they've been lost for the most part. Uh, very few histories uh, even, even, mention them, even mention it in, even in a little bit. Uh, but at the time that it was being created in the 1960s, the origins of the internet and the origins of this technology um, as a tool of surveillance and as a tool of control were very obvious to, the, to people back then. At the time, people did not see computers and computer networks as tools of liberation or, um, um, or, um, or utopian um, technologies. They saw them as tools of political and social control. And that specifically included the ARPANET, the network that would later grow into the internet. Um, so my book, Surveillance Valley, um, is, a, is an attempt to recover some of this lost history. Um, this history is important, not just from a historical perspective, but because you can draw a straight line from the internet's counterinsurgency origins um, and uh, to the internet technology that we use today, from Google to Facebook, and even privacy technology uh, like the Tor Project, which uh, most people just know as the dark web. And so um, tonight I'm going to read a couple of excerpts from the book to give you a sense of this lost history that, that, has, that, that uh, our culture has lost, right? And our culture has forgotten. Um, and then we'll open the floor for comments. Deal? September 26, 1969 was a mild fall day at Harvard University, but all was not well. Several hundred angry students gathered on campus and marched on the office of Harvard's dean. They piled inside and refused to leave. A day earlier, 500 students had marched through campus and a small contingent of activists from Students for a Democratic Society had broken into the school's Office of International Affairs and forced the administrators out on the street. Similar troubles were afoot just across the river at MIT where students were holding protests and, and teach-ins. Flyers posted on both campuses railed against the computerized people manipulation and the blatant prostitution of social science for the aims of the war machine. One leaflet warned, until the military social science complex is eliminated, social scientists will aid the enslavement rather than the liberation of mankind. <laughs> what exactly were the students protesting? The ARPANET, the network that would later grow into the internet. Earlier that year, activists from Students for a Democratic Society got their hands on a confidential ARPA proposal written by J.C.R. Licklider, the uh, legendary MIT scientist who had set up the ARPANET program in 1962. The document ran to almost 100 pages and outlined the creation of a joint Harvard-MIT ARPA program that would directly aid the agency's counterinsurgency mission. It was called the Cambridge Project. Once complete, it would allow any intelligence analyst or military planner connected to the ARPANET to upload, to upload dossiers, financial transactions, opinion surveys, welfare roles, criminal record histories, and any other kind of data, and to analyze that data in all sorts of sophisticated ways, sifting through reams of information to generate predictive models, mapping, up, mapping out social relationships, and running simulations that could predict human behavior. The project emphasized providing analysts with the power to study third world countries and left-wing movements. Students saw Cambridge Project and the bigger ARPANET that plugged into it as a weapon. A pamphlet handed out at, at an MIT protest explained, quote, the whole ARPA, the whole computer setup and the ARPA computer network will enable the government for the first time to consult relevant survey data rapidly enough to be used in policy decisions. The net result of this will be to make Washington's international policemen more effective in suppressing popular movements around the world. Another booklet featured a mock advertisement that gave a visual representation to these fears. It featured the Octoputer, 
a computer shaped like an octopus that had tentacles reaching into every sector of society. To activists, ARPA's Cambridge Project was part of a networked system of surveillance, political control, and military conquest being quietly assembled by diligent researchers and engineers at college campuses across, around the country. The college kids had a point. Uh, now I'm going to go to a segment, uh, six years in the future. <clears throat> on June 2nd, 1975, NBC correspondent Fort Rowan appeared on the evening news to report a stunning expose. Baby faced with light blue eyes, he spoke straight into the camera and told viewers that the military was building a sophisticated computer communications network and was using it to spy on Americans and share surveillance data with the CIA and NSA. He was talking about the internet, I mean, the ARPANET, the network that would later become the internet. Our sources say the Army's information on thousands of American protesters has been given to the CIA, and some of it is in the CIA computers now. We don't know who gave the order to copy and keep the files. What we do know is that once the files are computerized, the Defense Department's new technology makes it incredibly easy to move information from one computer to another, Rowan reported. This network links the computers at the CIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, the National Security Agency, more than 20 universities, and a dozen research centers like the Rand Corporation. Rowan had, sp had spent months piecing the story together, and for three days after the initial broadcast, he and his colleagues at NBC Evening News several, <clears throat> excuse me, aired several more reports looking more closely at this mysterious surveillance network and the shadowy agency that had built it. Rowan's expose was phenomenal. It was built on solid sources from the Pentagon, the CIA, the Secret Service, as well as key ARPANET insiders, some of whom were concerned about the creation of a network that could so seamlessly link multiple government surveillance systems. In the 1970s, the historical significance of the ARPANET was not yet apparent. What Rowan uncovered has become only more relevant in hindsight. It would take more than 20 years for the internet to spread into most American homes, and four decades would pass before Edward Stone's leaks made the world aware of the massive, massive amount of government surveillance happening on the internet. Today, people still think that surveillance is something foreign to the internet, something imposed on it from the outside by parano paranoid government agencies. Rowan's reporting from 40 years ago tells a different story. It shows how military and intelligence agencies used the network technology to spy on Americans in the very first version of the internet. In other words, surveillance was baked in from the very beginning. <clears throat> this is an important fact in the history of the internet, yet it has vanished down the collective memory hole. Crack any popular history of the internet today, and there's no mention of it. Even our foremost historians did not, know, did not seem to know it, it occurred. I'm going to go uh, 40 years into the future. I've got a time machine here. <laughs> um. <clears throat> All right. In 2011, less than a year after WikiLeaks broke onto the world stage, the Middle, East and North Af the Middle East and North Africa exploded like a power keg. Seemingly out of nowhere, huge demonstrations and protests swept through the region. It started in Tunisia, where a poor fruit seller lit himself on fire to protest humiliating harassment and extortion at the hands of the local police. <clears throat> Within weeks, massive anti-government protests spread to Egypt, Algeria, Oman, Jordan, Libya, and Syria. The Arab Spring had arrived. In Tunisia and Egypt, these protest movements toppled long-standing dictatorships from within. In Libya, opposition forces deposed and savagely killed Gaddafi, knifing him in the anus after an, ex an extensive bombing campaign from NATO forces. In Syria, uh, protests were met with a brutal crackdown from Bashar Assad's government and led to a protracted war that would claim hundreds of thousands of lives and triggered the worst refugee crisis in recent history, pulling in Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Israel, the CIA, the Russian Air Force and special operations teams, Al-Qaeda, ISIS. Arab Spring turned into a long, bloody winter. The underlying causes of these opposition movements were deep, complex, and varied from country to country. Youth unemployment, corruption, drought. 
high food prices, political repression, economic stagnation, and long-standing geopolitical aspirations were just a few of the factors. To a young and, and digitally savvy crop of State Department officials and foreign policy planners, these po political movements had one thing in common. They arose because of the democratizing power of the internet. They saw social media sites like Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as democratic multipliers that allow people to get, off, to get around official state-controlled information sources and organize political movements quickly and efficiently. Quote, the Che Guevara of the 21st century is the network, Alec Ross, a State Department official in charge of digital policy under Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, gushed in the NATO Review, the official magazine of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. His Che reference smacked of hypocrisy or perhaps ignorance. Che, after all, was executed by Bolivian forces backed by the United States, in particular the CIA. But the idea that social media could be weaponized against countries and governments deemed hostile to U.S. interest wasn't a surprise. For years, the State Department, in partnership with the Broadcasting Board of Governors and companies like Facebook and Google, had worked to train activists from around the world on how to use internet tools and social media to organize opposition uh, political movements. Countries in Asia, the Middle East, and Latin America, as well as former states like the Ukraine and Belarus, were all on the list. Indeed, the New York Times was surprised to find that many of the activists who played leading roles in the Arab Spring from Egypt to Syria to Yemen, had taken part in these training sessions. An Egyptian youth political leader who attended a State Department training sessions and then went on to lead protests in Cairo told the paper, quote, we learn how to organize and build coalitions. This certainly helped during the revolution. A different youth activist who had participated in Yemen's uprising was equally enthusiastic about the State Department social media training. Quote, it helped me very much because I used to think that change only takes place by force and by weapons. Staff from the Tor Project, a U.S. government anonymity tool that powers the dark web, played a leading role in some of these training sessions. Um, activists from Tunisia, Jordan, Lebanon, Bahrain were all involved. Activists later put the skills taught at these training sessions to use during the Arab Spring routing around internet blocks that their governments threw up to prevent them from using social media to organize protests. Uh, as one uh, activist uh, explained, there would be no access to Twitter or to Facebook in some of these places if you didn't have Tor. All of a sudden, you had all these dissidents exploding under their noses, and then down the road, you had a revolution. Tor rendered the government's efforts completely futile. They simply didn't know how to counter this move. The TOR project was a wild success. Um, the U.S. government had been funding it for years, and it had matured finally into a powerful foreign policy tool, a soft power cyber weapon with multiple uses and benefits. It hit spies and military agents on the Internet, enabling them to carry out their missions without leaving a trace. It was used by the U.S. government as a, as a persuasive regime change weapon as well, a digital crowbar that prevented countries from exercising sovereign control over their own Internet infrastructure. Counterintuitively, TOR also emerged as a focal point for anti-government privacy activists and, orga and organizations, a huge cultural success that made TOR that much more effective for its government backers by drawing fans and helping shield the project from scrutiny. And TOR was just the beginning. The Arab Spring provided the U.S. government with the confidence and the confirmation it was looking for. Social media, combined with technologies like TOR, could be tapped to bring huge masses of people under the streets, and could even trigger revolutions. Diplomats in Washington called it democracy promotion. Critics called it regime change. But it didn't matter what you called it. The U.S. government saw that it could leverage the Internet to sow discord and inflame political instability in countries it considered hostile to U.S. interests. Good or bad, it could weaponize social media and use it for insurgency, and it wanted more. In the wake of the Arab Spring, the U.S. government directed even more resources to Internet freedom technologies. The plan was to go beyond TOR and launch all sorts of crypto tools to leverage the power of social media to help foreign activists build political movements and organize protests. Encrypted chat apps and ultra-secure operating systems designed to prevent governments from spying on activists. Anonymous whistleblowing platforms that could help expose government corruption. And wireless networks that could be deployed instantaneously anywhere in the world to keep activists connected even if their government turned off the Internet. 
Strangely enough, these efforts are about to get a major credibility boost from an unlikely source, an NSA contractor by the name of Edward Snowden. Um, I think that's it. <laughs> I've got a question concerning the dark web. Um, there's been a bunch of myths going around for the past couple of years. Now, is, I don't know how to put this, the dark web immune to the military control? Or, I know that sounds kind of dumb, but, or to take it further, can you avoid Google by using the dark web? Um, well, that's a two-part question, right? Uh, so the first part is, is the dark web immune to military control? No, because the military funds the dark web. So the Tor project, that is the dark web, um, is anywhere from 90 to 99% funded by the US government. Um, uh, a third of its funding comes from the Navy. Uh, another third of it comes from the State Department. Another third of it comes from the Broadcasting Board of Governors, which is uh, very closely tied to the State Department. It's the um, broadcasting um, sort of arm of the federal government that funds um, it, um, basically American propaganda, radio stations and TV stations like Radio Free Asia, Radio Liberty, Radio Free Europe. Um, and so if the, uh, if the government wanted to control it or if it was, if the Tor was a threat to American power, right, and government power, uh, there would be a very easy solution to deal with it. You just pull the funding. And, uh, and uh, so that's the first part of your question. The second part of your question is, can you protect yourself from Google by using the dark web? No, you cannot. Because in, well, in certain very narrow circumstances, you can, you can use it to protect yourself from Google. Let's say you never log into any Google service. Uh, then you can uh, protect yourself from Google. But as soon as you have a phone that's tied to your identity, as soon as you log into Gmail, as soon as you um, uh, log into any of the uh, login services that Google offers, and they're basically all log login services. Tor does nothing to protect you, right? Because uh, because it just you, it doesn't matter where you come through, wh you know which dark hole you emerge out of. Uh, you're still just logging in with your personal information, right? And so um, it can, in, in certain narrow situations, can hide who you are. You know, it can hide your your traffic history from your ISP and things like that. It's true, but um, Tor does not um, threaten Google's um, business model. It does not threaten Facebook's business model because in order to use those services, for the most part, you have to log into them. Unless, you know, you create throwaway accounts and only, you know, like... Uh, but, I mean, so you're never going to log into anything on the Internet. I'm just, I'm saying, so if you can do that, if you never log into anything on the Internet, uh, you can protect yourself. I mean, so, but that, no, but, but no, no, it's a, it's a serious, it's a, you asked a serious question, I'm, I'm being serious. I mean, that, that's the only case in which, in how you can protect yourself using Tor. Um, and, the, and so, and Google and Facebook both support Tor financially in, 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 in various ways. And, and, and the reason they support these uh, Tor is because it doesn't threaten um, their business model in any way. In fact, it helps them by redirecting people's uh, privacy fears into this t tool. So they don't think about uh, what Google is doing, right? They, they, they think about, you know, using Tor to protect their privacy. And so uh, it sort of, it sort of uh, redirects people's attention away to, to, this, to the surveillance that's happening uh, as a matter of routine when you're using the, the Silicon Valley platforms. Hi. Hello. Um, a few weeks ago, I was sitting home alone mumbling to myself, as I often do. And then all of a sudden, I realized some of what I've been saying would probably be very disturbing to another person. <laughs> um, I, find, I find myself in that situation, too. So. Yeah, well, I, I looked down, and I noticed that I was, I was carrying my own personal telescreen with me yeah. at that moment, yeah. which means I may not have been alone at that moment. Um, you used the term memory hole in your little yeah. talk. Uh, have our rulers just coincidentally uh, found themselves on the path towards uh, a George Orwell future? Or is it a conscious decision that they're using that as a model? 
I mean, I think George Orwell, you know, um, George Orwell, you know, it's a, it's a great novel, um, but it's actually been proven to be, you know, he, he, he didn't predict the future. The future is not a centralized government with a, with, a, with a clearly evil face on something, you know, on your TV screen looking at you all the time and watching you. It's actually uh, not a centralized government at all. It's actually all these different diverse entities that are private. And it doesn't seem to be a centralized directive of any kind, right? So there's no Big Brother. We can't. We don't know who Big Brother is. There's not a face. To, we can't uh, pin to it. So I don't know if they were, uh, you know, going off the 1984 plan. Um, I don't think so. And anyway, you know, Apple smashed uh, Big Brother in 1984. So um, and I and I, you know, I saw Ridley Scott directed that film. So like, uh, it's I don't I, I I don't know if there was look. Things, there, I don't think there's a grand conspiracy, right, um, to hide this stuff from us. I think, um, you know, if you if you re look read my book, I I, I trace the, the path of how we got this amnesia or how we how culture completely forgot that something that it knew not that long ago. I mean, one of the things that was really really surprised me and shocked me was was how obvious um, ARPANET was um, as a surveillance tool to, to people back then. So I mean, in 1969. All right, 1969. This is the first. Uh, this is the year that ARPANET went online. Uh, this, this, this is the year of the first node between UCLA and, and Stanford. And already uh, people were protesting the ARPANET, and, and already were talking about it as a, um, as a as a as a as a technology of surveillance and social control that, if allowed to grow and to expand unchecked, would would become this. Uh, surveillance tool and 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 uh, and be used to not just monitor us but also to control us and so the the forgetting part um, I think goes in goes in line with the commercialization of of the technology so when when the ARPANET and when the internet became lucrative and you can make a lot of money on based on it there was a lot of marketing kicked in into this space and really transformed the way that we think about technology. And uh, you, you know, the 1984 Apple ad was a prime example of that um, sort of cultural shift, and driven back by a lot of money and by commercial interests. So I don't think there was like a Big Brother conspiracy uh, to make us forget, you know. But I think it's actually much more pernicious than that, because memory, you you, you get a, when you look at history, you, you get a sense that memory tracks with power, and so people remember. Um, things that are that power wants you to remember, and you forget things that go against power, because those things just don't get funded. Those ideas aren't given space in society, because things are funded. You know, you have to have you have to make a living as a journalist, as an author, as all these things. And so, you, you know, it's a very decentralized kind of process, but it just, our memory tracks with power. And so, the victors write history, and Silicon Valley is the victor. In our society. Hypothetically, if somebody uh, switched out a burner phone like once a week and used only Wi-Fi, would that <laughs> help protect them or, or not? I, I'm just I mean, I, mean, I mean, who are you protecting yourself from is the question. Right. Well, the government. I mean, if, if somebody... Why does the government care about you? Well... Are you I, trying I, to overthrow it? No, no, don't answer no, the question. No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> because Sorry. if you are, you're, you're screwed. <laughs> just don't do it. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, don't tell me about it. <laughs> no, but but look, but it's a serious question because you know, look, there's this pervasive fear of of, of 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 being watched. We are all worried about being watched. But the question is, who's watching you? To what end? Right. 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 So, like, you know, um, I know that really wealthy people are always very freaked out about the IRS watching them. This is something that they hate because they're watching their their money. Like, I don't really care about the IRS watching because I'm I usually don't have that much uh, to declare. You know, so that 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 is a, that is a surveillance fear that I don't really have. Right, but I know a lot of people have that fear. That's that's the most prominent fear that they have. They have. They're not really worried about the NSA. But they're worried about the IRS. You know, and so so there's all sorts of kind of surveillance, right? Also, you know, um, you know Charles Koch of the Koch Industries worries about the EPA, and the surveillance that you know that agency could carry out. So there's all sorts of forms of surveillance. You know, in in a, in a democratic society or in any kind of society that has laws and rules. Uh, there has to be methods of, of making sure that people follow these rules and laws, right? And there's processes in place of, very, of various kinds that surveil people on some level, right? Um, and so, so when people are worried about surveillance, you know, you kind of have to say, well, what are you actually worried about? What is the thing that scares you? And if it's just some kind of 
very um, vague, very hazy idea of just some big brother, you know, watching you. Right, just a personal privacy thing, yeah. But I mean, you know, when you walk down the street, right, right, do you right, have yeah, privacy? Yeah. People watch you, you know? Right. Um, and, and with Tor, if you use Tor, are you more are, are you more likely to be watched by the government if you do yes, use Tor? Yes, hundred percent. Because they know you're using Tor, is that right? Like just from my home computer, they yes, uh, they would probably know. Okay. Edward Snowden's Edward Snowden's documents, uh, a couple of slides that, that uh, uh, he released, show that even if you go um, to the to to the website, just to mm -hmm. go to the website, you're already you're being tra you're going to be tracked much more um, severely. Okay. much more closely and uh, of course yeah um it's a self-selecting mechanism right so you if you use tor and not that many people use tor and it's very okay. obvious it's very easy to see who uses tor it just makes you more obvious but again the question is well, who are you hiding from and i think this is a key this is a key point that i, I think we need to you know, think about much more um um i mean I, i'm a journalist and i've uh, you know reported from all sorts of countries i i uh, made my you know started my career uh, reporting out of Russia. And I knew I was being surveilled. I, could, I would sometimes see people jump out of a car and with a giant telephoto lens and snap pictures of me. You know, um, <laughs> and so, but like that is something that you, ex you accept with the territory. You know that you're, gonna, you're being surveilled. And there's nothing that you can do to stop that. You just know that that's what, that's what that's, it's part of the job. And right? does, does Tor cut down on ads or just using an ad blocker is better for that? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, ad blockers are, are, are okay, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, they, they, they seem to not be working that, that well anymore. Okay. The blo ad blockers are being blocked. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I had tour quite a while back. Okay. But, but it then it quit. Then it quit working. So. Let's talk afterwards. Anyway, Let's okay. talk afterwards. Yeah. We'll talk afterwards. I'll, 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 I'll help you out. All right. In regard to um, surveillance, everything you've talked about is, um, as far as I can tell so far, is internet based. Mm hmm. Uh, we have a rise of camera surveillance with publicly located cameras, bank cameras, ATMs, et cetera, traffic cameras. And due to the uh, inherent connectivity with the internet and how those, that information is captured and used by various entities just for their own normal purposes, what connection do you see with that aspect? It all kind of tying together, whether it's for sinister purposes or even just for marketing, where what demographics of people visit places and how to target seemingly unimportant things, um, but as well as everything you've talked about, which is you know, much more sinister sounding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I think they're very much connected, uh, of course. I mean, uh, the internet is just an aspect of it, right? So. There's, um, you know, tying up and all the inputs, right? So again, the the holy grail is to create a radar system for human society, right? I mean, it's been from the very beginning. Um, you know, uh, a lot of the people, a lot of the people who went on to design the ARPANET and build the ARPANET actually uh, cut their teeth on on building um, an, the the first radar, early war warning radar system, Sage, um, at, at MIT Lincoln Labs, and. Um, so from then on, you know, um, the idea of treating society as, as, as like an airplane, you know, being you, that you can monitor it, and you can actually envelop it in, in, a, in a cybernetic system that could monitor everything. I mean, that's the holy grail because then you could, you know, the idea is you could plot vectors, right? And, you know, if you look at a, how an airplane, airplane is moving, you can see the vector and then you can predict where, where that airplane will be, you know, at a certain time in the future, right? And even all the probabilities of where it can turn, you know, you can, you, you know, this, you know your, the limitations of their, of, of, of how, of how fast they're going and how, how, you know, the arc at, at which they can turn and all these things. So you can actually predict, you know, with some, with some uh, certainty where they'll be, or at least the area where they would be in the future. And so you, if you can do that for an airplane, why can't you do that for a person, right? Why can't you do that for a, um, for a group of people, for a whole country, right? And so. The idea is, you, you know, the internet is just an aspect of it, but you have all the inputs there, right? So if it's cameras, if it's um, Wi-Fi signals, you know, and things like that, and, uh, your, your phone is connected always to a, to a satellite. Um, um, so yes, I mean, they're all connected. And the thing about the internet, it, it started out as a, as, a, as a purely a system of transferring data and sharing it amongst um, intelligence agencies and also being able to, to analyze that data. But as the, when, as the internet went commercial, 
it, it became much more than that. It, it wasn't just a tool that transferred data and analyzed data. It, was, it became the, the place where things happened, right? It was no longer just, um, it's, it became the field of battle. Like it be, so you, people actually are doing things on the internet rather than you having to go and collect data externally to the internet and then input into the internet. It's already being input in real time by people as they live. And so, um, and what do we do on the internet? You know, we, we don't go on the internet to just give our stuff to the NSA or to the FBI. We go on the internet to buy things, to, to date, um, right, to chat with friends, to share news stories, to, you know, uh, um, you know we, we are, you know, uh, use our phones to find directions and um, find a good restaurant to eat at. Things that we just do normally, but that, pl that, that just enhances the surveillance, the surveillance um, uh, capability of, of the system in, in, in whole. So they're connected and they're all, uh, so I think your, your, your comment is com completely right, but maybe if there's, a, there's another person, right? Uh, Wait. Just the follow-up is that everybody here is instantly pegged as interested in this. Totally. <laughs> Yes. All right. Hey there. Hello. Um, so I have two classes of questions. The first is more personal. Uh oh. How do you live your life with all this information? And second, being, has this? How has this impacted your use on the internet? Not or at all. Generally. Not at all. No one. Because I. No I, impact. <laughs> I mean, I no because I. Um, no, because I think that <clears throat> look. Um, because there's nothing that I can do on an individual level to, to do anything about this. Uh, I'm, I don't believe, um, so <clears throat> the, after Edward Snowden revealed that there was all this surveillance happening on the internet, that it wasn't just the NSA, but the NSA in partnership with the biggest Silicon Valley companies, right? We're in partnership working together in secret to turn the internet into this massive spying apparatus. And at the time, everyone believed that something was gonna happen. There was gonna be reforms of some kind, right? But instead what happened was people got uh, herded into this very narrow band of, of politics where they are, were told to download an app, get this encrypted chat you know, app for your, for your phone, get Signal, get Tor. That's how you protect yourself. And people actually didn't politically get together and do anything. The political moment evaporated. And so the political moment when there was actually sort of public consciousness and people were really focused on this to do something and to, 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 to start some kind of reforms that evaporated. And so I think that surveillance is a political issue, not a technical issue. Surveillance always happens in a society. I mean, you walk down the street, you're being surveilled because other people are watching you. You know, privacy is something that we've come to uh, see as almost give it some kind of strange fetish. Mm -hmm. Whereas in reality, we're not private animals. You know, we're social animals. We want to be around people. We want people to look at us. We want to look at people. And so you know, there's different kinds of privacy and different kinds of surveillance. And so regulating that and figuring out what that is is a political and cultural issue, not a technical issue, mm -hmm. right? And so I think, you know, and the same goes for the internet. So if we wanna have a surveil have, a, have an internet that isn't spying on people and isn't being dominated by these, by these giant corporations that are tracking everything we do, and then of course plugging that, you know, system into, into the national security state, we have to have a society that doesn't do that. You know, the internet is dominated by spies and, and giant corporations because our society is dominated by these forces. Mm -hmm. The two are inseparable. And so me, you know, downloading something, an app, and, and, and hiding, you know, in my own little shell on my computer is not going to do anything because, again, as a journalist, I understand that if I'm trying to hide, it's only going to make me even more obvious. And so I, I, I go, you know, I, I spend my, my life realizing that there's not much I can do. And if someone hacks into my computer, you know, well, and so leaks all my emails, well, I'm screwed, you know, and... Uh, but no backlash from these organizations, no emails or... What do you from, from the ones that I'm writing about? Yeah. Well, I mean, they've taken, depends who. I mean, uh, the, the, the people who are, uh, make the Tor project, no, there was a pretty serious backlash. I mean, there were death threats, there were all these things. Uh, uh, <laughs> but from, the, the, like, companies like Google, no, they take a smarter approach. They, they ignore you, and they just don't answer the phone. And so, and so they, do, they ignore you until they can't ignore you anymore. And so, so far they've been ignoring you. Okay, uh, perfect. Easier mm -hmm. than the deaths. Yes, yes. Um, and then I have one technical question oh, one. from my friend. Um, if the dark web is funded by government and big business and hackers develop on dark web, why don't they do anything about it? I mean, tell that to uh, Ross Ulbricht. 
Ross Holbrook is spending like two consecutive life sentences or two. He's never getting out of jail, and he's the guy who invented, you know, the, the dark web marketplace. So he's in jail. So they are doing something about it. And so, um, um, again, if you look at the history of the Tor project and the dark web, it's, it's useful to the U.S. government in many different ways. And so it's useful to have it around, but it's, it only works if there are all sorts of people who are using it. It isn't just spies or it isn't just up, you know, um, sort of revolutionaries that are backed by the U.S. government, you know, uh, in, in other countries. If it's, if it's like everybody uses it, if paranoid people use it who are just worried about their privacy, if people who are doing legal business, you know, running massively legal businesses online are using it, it's good. It's, it, it, it's, like, um, it's like a busy marketplace or a square that hides all the other stuff that happens there um, that's useful to the government. So, you know, it's not, this stuff is, is, is it, it's kind of hard to accept. Like, why would the U.S. government be funding something that's supposed to uh, diminish its own power? It, it seems um, contradictory. Uh, but, but maybe because it doesn't diminish its power. Hmm. Then maybe that's the answer. Maybe there's a simple answer for that. But right, it's useful cool. to come. Yeah. Thanks. I feel like there should be another microphone here because I'm just, I'm just not looking at, I'm not looking at this part of the room here. <laughs> I was wondering if you could talk about your process of writing this book, like some about your methods. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. When you came up with the thesis, before, during, or after the research. The thesis came after I started writing it because I thought the book initially was um, going to be somewhat uh, uh, much more limited in scope. Uh, was going to be less historical because I didn't, um, I knew of course that the internet was developed by the Pentagon, um, but like a lot of other people, I thought that like that was something that happened and you know, there was a kind of a transformation or, or a privatization that occurred of some sort and a transfer of that technology. And then, you know, that's, that's, that, that's all there's to it. And you know, the internet came out of the need to survive a nuclear attack was what I, was what I thought it was. And so, but when I went into the, um, the archives and I started looking at declassified records and I started looking at old ARPA reports and old contracts and old proposals. Um, I realized that there was this whole other thing, suddenly just like it just, it just was on the surface, it wasn't even deep, that there's a whole aspect to it, the counterinsurgency component. Um, and that is something that I, that I had not really uh, seen mentioned in any history of the internet. Maybe just bits and pieces of it, but not really um, explored at all and it was like the the, the prominent thing that you see, you see when you go into the archives and to look at the original documents and look at the historical record. And so, no, uh, the thesis uh, uh, of the Internet as a counterinsurgency weapon, actually, I didn't, I didn't go into the book um, thinking that that was going to be my thesis. I was just going to sort of look at the, at the interface between um, um, Silicon Valley and the national security state and, and, and to see the, look at the relationship between those, these, these two entities and look, and look at the, the business of Silicon Valley, you know, for-profit surveillance, as I, as I kind of think about it. Uh, and so, but, it, but that, in the end, became a much smaller component of the book, although it's there because it's, it's part of the continuum, it's part of the narrative. But the, the counterinsurgency history became, um, came much later. And so it was, it was, it was, it was a natural, um, um, natural process. And I, I, again, like, what really astounded me um, was finding out how um, how much how, how much dumber we are today than, than people were I guess you know half a century ago I mean it just it, there's no other way to put it you know like uh, we've actually you know we've grown up with this internet we have it all around us we think we understand it you know we think we're savvy yet we are our, our concept of it and what it is and it's 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 um, it's history and it's um, it's sort of integration with political structures and politics is like, I mean, it's lobotomized almost, you know? And so when I went back and, and read, you know, there's an incredible booklet that students from Democratic Society produced in 1969. Go back to this episode quite a bit. They produced a whole booklet about the ARPANET and they looked at its, um, its and they in, in, in essence predicted what the internet would become. Of course, they couldn't know what it would become because it became something much more kaleidoscopic, you know? It's, it's much more fractured, you know, back then it was just a government system built by you know, a military contractor. Of course, now it's much more sophisticated. There's all sorts of things that are built on top of it. And, um, but they, they uh, at, the, at, a, at their core, predicted 
what the internet is and and understood it very very deeply and so uh, when I when I when I came across that I was like whoa this is this is incredible and it made me wonder you know what, how can other historians that have went into the same archives uh, came across the same documents how come they didn't write about this how come this wasn't mentioned in their in their histories and uh, and you know um, I mean I don't think it's a conspiracy I just think that um, you know, ideology is a powerful thing. And so when the ideology of the internet is really powerful in our culture to the point where we think, you know, democracy and, and the internet are almost synonyms now. And so when you go and write the history of the internet and you see that, wait a second, it's a counterinsurgency tool that people were protesting 50 years ago, but it's supposed to be democracy and it's supposed to be this great, ama amazing thing that's gonna free the world and it's gonna empower us, it, like they, they clash. And I think it just it's, it becomes hard to incorporate and hard to explain, and so it just dropped and not looked at. And so I think uh, my book, you know, it's just the first, it's the first uh, sort of glance at this dark history in it, but I think it's not the, it's not the, first, it's not the last one. I think we're going to see a lot more of this kind of history um, um, excavated and, and analyzed uh, because, you know, um, this is just like the tip of the iceberg. So, probably more than you bargained for there. I mean, I think just the politics were different back then, right? I mean, I think people were much more um, critical in, of, of, of a U.S. empire and, um, and the interface between uh, corporations and uh, the military-industrial complex. I mean, this, is the, this was sort of like the, um, you know, uh, my, my colleague likes to call it the, the American glassness, you know, which is the, in, in this, Gorbachev had this sort of period of openness that, uh, um, that uh, the Soviet Union had in, in the late 80s, where like things were sort of archives were opened, uh, you know, uh, restrictions on um, on the press were lifted a little bit. There was a kind of a softening and uh, in, in, of control. And in, in the 70s were kind of like that. The 60s and 70s in America were kind of like that. And I think there was a freeing of 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 of, of uh, a kind of a political um, I don't know how you'd call it, but uh, like a, like an openness and uh, much more of they were a lot more sophisticated politically to some degree. I mean, in the end, they failed. And so they couldn't have been that sophisticated or that effective, you know, because, but I think it was just naturally came out of it. They saw it. And also, I think a large part of it is, is that back then, you know, computers were always tied to some powerful entity, some powerful corporation, because these computers were giant. You know, they would have to take up a room. So in order to even have a computer, you'd have to be a very powerful institution. And so they were usually tied to a, corpor a corporation or a government agency. So it was much easier to see this, this connection between the two. But when, you know, when we have little computers in our, in our, in our bedrooms and, you know, we have these amazing ads by Apple, uh, it's harder to, you know, see the, the sort of the underlying reality because still, you know, it's a giant corporation making that computer and the wires that connect them are still giant, owned by giant corporations and things like that. So, in a way, they had it easier because they could see, it was clearer to see the connections between power and computers. This will be our last question. So I have just two real quick yes, no questions, and then just then the actual question. Okay. So <laughs> my understanding is uh, I like IRC this. is, uh, I mean, sorry, TOR is central to uh, anonymous activists using IRC uh, to stay anonymous. Is that true? I mean, I think so. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, they do use Tor, I think, yeah. I think so, yeah. Um, and what's that? Right. But they, they, to, they bent what? Uh, to, to, keep, to keep their IP addresses, you know, from tracking them down. Some well, of them. Some of them. <laughs> anyways, the ones that got arrested didn't do that. Anyway. So they, they use Tor. And there's some that are still at large, right? So if the government uh, controls Tor, why, don't, why haven't they caught them all? I mean, uh, well, they... Um, I don't know, because they don't need to catch everyone all the time, and they, they didn't do anything. Like, why would they need to be caught, and what did they do? So there's, like, there's anonymous, there's, look, there's um, anonymous activists that went and uh, DDO, DDoS to um, PayPal um, to protest, you know, the boycott against WikiLeaks. And they, they, got, they got pretty screwed in, 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 the, in the process, but they didn't use Tor. So, I mean, look, Tor does protect you to some degree, but if you are an actual threat, uh, and you use it all the time, you will be unmasked. 
Um, but it does work. I mean, it, it's 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 not like a totally, um, uh, it's not a completely transparent. Although I don't know, you know. Again, when you're dealing with entities like the NSA, we just don't know what goes on in there, right? Because if you're if, if you are funding a tool that you want people to think works, you don't want to catch everyone who uses it. It doesn't make any sense. And so so but we don't, so it's hard to it's hard to read into the intention intentions of these of some of the most secretive agencies on the planet, you know, we just don't know. And so, but you, all we can, all that is, is, is I can do as a journalist is, is to look at, uh, you know, I can follow the money and look at the funding and I can also look at the interests that surround it and, and to look at who benefits from this and how it's used and who, who is truly empowered. Sure, a kid sitting somewhere, you know, like, you know, like uh, making jokes about Scientology, you know, like it's, he's not really a threat to anybody. You know, like so, uh, but if you run these, you know, illegal um, uh, marketplace like Ross Ulbricht, who you know, who created Silk Road, he's in jail. And if you look at <clears throat> the logs that he kept uh, as he was running this, <laughs> this his business, I mean, it, you'd, you'd you'd have him like right right in, you know, like oh yeah, you know, the Tor uh, server software crashed again, leaked my IP address, and he'd like it would happen all the time, and like. And he knew that the FBI and the, uh, the DEA was, they were like actively looking for him. And there were actually, you know, at that moment, like two agents that were uh, like, you know, uh, had infiltrated his organization and were trying, being, uh, pretending to be his friends, but they didn't know who he was. But he was be, being actively sought and his, his server was crashing all the time, leaking his IP address. And that's how he was caught in the end. And so, I mean, I, I look at that and I think like, wow, that's crazy. That he believed in it so much that even reality, didn't stop him from, from using this thing, knowing that his server cr crashed and leaked his IP address, leaked his identity, in effect. He still used it and still believed it. You know, um, again, ideology and, uh, is, is a powerful thing, you know, and it makes you uh, ignore, um, ignore facts and ignore, ignore things that are pretty apparent to other people. And so, um, I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.